here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go, this is it. This is Top Flight Time Machine. I am Andy Hotbody Dawson. Pow, pow, pow. I'm Sam Nifty Delaney. So what? Welcome along to the beginning of a new odyssey. This is called the Rhubarb Odyssey. And we're looking at the uh, the seminal, I nearly said iconic there, seminal um, BBC One five-minute episode cartoon um, which rocked the world of the children in 1974. It shook it's every Rhubarb. child to his fucking core. Exactly. Forever. We were never the same again since. And the repeats right. kept coming and we kept lapping it up. Uh, Rhubarb, also known as Rhubarb and Custard, but its proper name was Rhubarb. Actually, we're going to look at the very first episode of it. And Custard's not in it very much. It's mm. got a bit of a pilot episode kind of feel about it. Uh, custard's there but it's, it's all about rhubarb uh, the dog and it's the first episode um, and um, yeah I'm looking at the uh, the Wikipedia page we'll do a little bit of background first of all before we get properly into the episode mm. what's the episode called again it's called uh, When Rhubarb Made a Spike which <laughs> doesn't make a lot of sense but then no, when we watch the episode that sounds brilliant what should we do yeah. for the first episode why don't we have it that the dog makes a spike? Spikes are good, aren't they? Kids are into spikes. Kids yeah, love they are. Spikes. They love fucking spikes. <laughs> when there's a they're spike like, around, you know there's going to be some action. But are we worried that the children might imitate rhubarb and make spikes of their own? Yes. Yeah, so what? I love the, them. That's the jeopardy of it. Yeah. Well, just then. Then after then, you say six months down the line, once there's been a few incidents, you can knock out one of the public service announcements. All about spikes and not not doing them. Parents, what do you reckon? I'll we'll do get, that for you as well. We'll get fucking Donald Pleasant to do the voiceover. <laughs> Mothers, and your children playing with spikes. <laughs> might, might there be spikes in your area? Perhaps there will. <laughs> Tell your children not to play with spikes. Only think safe. Only think <laughs> think calm. Think spike. It probably wouldn't be. Don't tell your children to play. That would just be like, uh, if you're playing with spikes, play safe. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with spikes, but you yeah. know, just be careful. Spikes are a legitimate toy for all children, as long as they treat them with caution. <laughs> they can get out of control. <laughs> spikes can be dangerous but unless you handle them carefully. Spikes like, are like the most fun. There was a there was a Christmas, wasn't there? And it was like every month it was a craze. In like I think it was like seventy four. It was a bit before I was born, but like there was just the, the year of the spike, and every mum mm. was desperately trying to get their kid a spike. But like yeah. everywhere sold out of spikes. It sold out, didn't they? And they yeah. were like changing hands for silly money, silly mm. money in those days. In put- in car parks of pubs and stuff like that. Yeah, and yeah. you get, like, illegitimately crafted spikes as well that people were knocking up. Shit, shit spikes from Taiwan. Snide spikes. Yeah. Yeah. This is fucking crap. This, well, take it or leave it. <laughs> you, well, tick tock. It's fucking this... 36 hours till Christmas morning, right? <laughs> till ground zero, round the Christmas tree. If you want your kiddies to wake up spikeless, and that's the sort of Christmas you're hoping for... Fine, be my guest. At the moment, you're up, You're out of options. It's the Taiwan snide spike on now. <laughs> this, this fucking spike can't penetrate anything. It's a load of shit. Yeah, take it or leave it. I'm not si- I'm not going to stand here and tell you it's like a top fucking best of British kite mark spike fashioned from Sheffield Steel. It's not. It's not that kind of spike. But it is a spike. <laughs> Technically, it's a Look- spike. Look, kids are stupid. They don't know. They'll just sit at Christmas morning and go, oh, I've got a spike. Brilliant. And they'll they'll just, play with it a couple of times, be, pu- be bored of it, chuck it away. They'll be perfectly happy. They'll go up to a little brother or sister and spike him a few times in the rib. Try <laughs> and spike spiking. him in the eye. Bit of eye <laughs> spiking. A&E is fucking <clears throat> full on Christmas Day afternoon with the kids who've been spiked in the eye by their siblings. <laughs> You probably want this cheap one because it's it's not very good. It's not gonna, you know, they won't go blind with it. It'll it, hurt them a bit, but they'll probably, go blind. I'll be honest; it probably won't even pierce the retina. <laughs> Thank God. Long term, it's your best bet. <laughs> uh, 
so yeah rhubarb uh, first episode when rhubarb made a spike but um, we'll get at that we'll have a little background stuff from the Wikipedia page uh, British animated children's television series created by Grange Calvary what a oh, name that what is a name. Grange I'm actually going to so quickly click on that right what Fucking is it he hell. made some other things as well he made Noah and Nelly in Skylark oh man Noah and really Nelly, if that. anything, I loved as much, if not more, than Rhubarb because really? it I came don't... along. It came along when I was like five. Right, uh, Rhubarb was around, but Nora and Nelly felt like it was. It felt like it was uh, Grinch Calvary, Sergeant Pepper. Almost, <laughs> you know, Rhubarb. Rhubarb was his revolver. Right, Nora and Nelly. <laughs> this is when he took things. Nelly, he was in his, his imperial phase. Yeah, Nora and Nelly were on the uh, on the Skylark boat. Uh, you know, gnawing around like off the Bible, right. and all the animals. I don't know if you remember it. All the right. animals had two heads, oh. and um, because obviously there was two of each animal on the ark. Oh yeah, but this was a, a slight twist. This was the this is where the LSD kicked in, I think, because each animal just had two heads and one body, and one head was always happy, and the other head was always grumpy. Oh, sounds like me. Yeah, so all Listen. just one head. Grange Cavalry was like this. I like to take creative chances. Yeah. <laughs> People love rhubarb. Uh, but if I'm honest with myself, you know, it was, I was playing it safe. I was playing within my own safety, my comfort boundaries, I call them. <laughs> By the time I'd had, a, but the success I had with that and the praise I was, the plaudits I received, that spurred me on. I was experimenting a lot with psychedelics at the time. And I decided I wanted to take a lot of creative risks and push some boundaries. And that is how Noah and Nelly came about. Came to me during a particularly traumatic um, acid trip where I thought, what about a boat with a bunch of animals with two heads? But each head has conflicting emotion. Oh, man, he did a... Uh, there's a blog that he did as well, Grinch Calvary, and there's, there's a rhubarb book, but he just did it on Apple Books. Self-published. Self-published. And it was... Cut uh, out the middle, man. Cut yeah, out, exactly. I could have got it published, but what's the point? What well, do I want to pay? Give a percentage to the publisher, percentage to the designer, public, some percentage to the fucking Mr. Waterstones. No, thank you. Bang. I'll Stick it lot. straight out, self-publishing. Yeah, Keep it all up. Right, Apple take 30%, but that leaves me with 70 That's better than any deal you're going to get with fucking Hodder well, and you, Staunton, let, Simon let and Schuster. You. Let me ask you, clever cunt. Have you got 70% of what? Anything? Mm, no. Well then, shut up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm going to buy the book. <laughs> oh, I want to read that now. <laughs> it's on Apple Books still. Uh, Rhubarb, an Ill- illuminated biog woofy, because it's a dog and it woofs. And he's got a blog as well. Uh, he's sadly no longer with us. He died uh, last year. It says oh, here. that's a shame. I don't remember that getting much coverage. Should have done. I don't remember either. August, August 2021. Um, but let's not dwell on his death. Let's celebrate his life. Uh, and he, uh, you know, once again, um, his breeding ground was advertising agencies. Interesting. Uh, in the in the late 60s. So, you I know, did not once know again, that. we come back to that. It says, after art college, Calvary worked for a number of advertising agencies in London. It was while at uh, Massius... Macy's, yeah. Um, Macy's, that he met his wife, Hanny, who was a copywriter. Um, and Rhubarb was loosely based on Calvary's own dog, a Welsh border collie. Custom was oh. drawn after the huge cat who lived next door. It was that simple. He's drawn his own dog and the cat next door, and it changed his fucking life. How about that? Absolutely brilliant. Well done, Grange. Yeah. Um, and... Each cartoon was written by Calvary and directed by the mighty Bob Godfrey. Oh, I don't know about um, him. What's his story? Uh, well, Bob Godfrey, he did uh, Rhubarb and he also did um, Nora, and Nelly. Nora and Nelly. And he also did, if I said to you, Henry's Cat. Fucking love Henry's Cat, mate. Henry's I Cat. I can't believe that Henry's Cat kept going until 1995. It says here, 1983 it? to 1995. This advertising background thing is now making sense to me because I used to 
When I used to go into my dad's office, they had these special felt tip pens, which I always mm. thought was the most... Uh, there wasn't much about the advertising industry that ever appealed to me. But one thing did, and it was these fucking special, like, chubby felt tip pens they had that they drew yeah. all their drawings with, right? Yeah. That's all they were fucking doing, was sitting around doing drawings most of the time, right? God. Um, Art so that, club, wasn't it? Yeah, Basically. it's just fucking... And anyway, they had these felt tips, and I'd always, like, say, you got any old ones that I can have... But they had a, I can't remember what they're called, but they had a particular look about them. They bled a lot. So you draw, if you drew an outline in your black pen and then coloured it in, you couldn't go right to the edge, Andy, because the ink would bleed out. It was that strong. Have you ever used a felt tip like that? I have, yeah. Yeah. So, but then I was watching Henry's Cat and Come Think It Rhubarb, and I'd always think, they look like they've been drawn with them felt tips that they only have at mm. like ad agencies, and now Probably it all had. makes sense. Wasn't that the same kind of felt tip that Tony Hart used to use? Stubby one, maybe. Yeah. Or oh, what else am I thinking? Where else have I seen those big fat felt uh, tips? What about Rolf Harris? He used to. Oh, I can't mention him. <laughs> I read Cancelled. a great mate. I read a great story about Rolf Harris yesterday. Right. <laughs> It, oh, on, I'm reading that. Um, I'm I'm reading that. Um, uh, one, two, three, four. Craig Brown Beatles book, oh, which yeah, is yeah. a wonderful book to read because all it is is anecdote, 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 anecdote. Yeah, written by one of the masters of the English <laughs> language, Craig Brown, who really is a sensational writer. Few people write a story better than him, and so it's just like each chapter is very short, punchy, revealing anecdote. Very often something mm. trivial. At Christmas 1963, I think it was, just as they they were going sort of nuclear, right? Mm. They did a Christmas show at Finsbury Park, and it, the whole and there was a couple of other acts. They were the headline act, and it was three nights yeah. running, and the whole thing was compared by Rolf Harris. Oh wow, that's amazing, isn't Hell. it? And Rolf Harris that's- came out and started singing about, started telling the audience about kangaroos. I suppose. Back in those days, Australians were still extremely exotic. The idea of Australia, I mean, it remains exotic, really, doesn't it? But like back then, Mm. we're talking pre-neighbours. They're like, who is this guy from this faraway land? And he was talking to them about kangaroos. And John Lennon got hold of the microphone backstage that had been left on and started (laughs) just fucking heckling him and going, that's what you say, Rolf, but I reckon that's the right load of old bollocks. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and Rob Harris like just carried on ploughed through didn't acknowledge it and he go and another thing about the kangaroos is they carry a, they can grow up to a maximum height of seven foot and then you just see John Lennon backstage going yeah whatever you're making it all up as you go along <laughs> <laughs> and Rolf Harris went fucking bananas when he finished his bit he went and he stormed into their room kicked the door open was like listen arseholes that was completely unprofessional. If you want to ruin someone's show, ruin your own. Don't interfere with my act. He you like, did it again, I'm going to snap your balls off. Yeah, it was like that. He tried to start on the Beatles. And they were all, a bit, they were all like laughing at him. Um, Fucking great. Yeah, that, that is, that's, that's why the book is great because it's non-stop stuff like that, basically. And you'll get you'll get like lots of people they tweeting about it saying that oh I think I think you see there that John Lennon knew all along all about Rolf Harris oh, yeah. from back then. <laughs> fucking hell! Um, I've remembered where I've where the fucking fat felt tip action <laughs> right, yeah. comes from. Um, Quentin Blake on Jack and Ori oh, drawing okay, his pictures yeah. as he told the stories. Yeah. That I'm, was a thing. I'm trying and he'd to have a big a blank page and he'd draw the picture according to what the story was and then turn the pa- the paper over, flip it over, like a whiteboard type thing, and then start the next one. You know what? Yeah. I was so into these felt tips. I can't find them, the picture of them, because I can't remember what the brand was. But I was so into them. And they smelt amazing, Andy. And if you sniffed them, you could get yeah. high, which is something I discovered as I got a bit older, right? So they were so strong. They were petroleum-based. And, um, hey, proper ones. And I was so into them that I've <laughs> there was an art shop near my house and I used to go in and look at them because they'd just have racks of them. They were sort of metal. Mm. They were, they had a metal casing. Yeah. They looked not unlike a chode. They, they were chode-shaped and, and <laughs> dimensioned. They were like chodes. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> right? And they were metal and they had metal lids as well. And Archards. Yeah, Archards. <laughs> and they had them in this local art shop. And I was probably obsessed with them because they were in my dad's office, right? And um, I just wanted them. And they were on this huge mm. rack in the shop. But they were really expensive. Like, you know, mm. it was like two pounds for one or something. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was like mad because they were only used by pros. And um, I just I'd, remember my granddad had some, but I can't it? think why he would have had them. And I, I don't think I was allowed to use them, but I like to sniff them. Yeah, because the sniff they were amazing. Incredible. But and, they, you um, get off your face with them. Slightly. Yeah, you really could. People did. Um, mm. They, uh, yeah, they were really expensive, and I don't know. I don't want to come across all like Oliver Twist, but um, I asked my mum for like some for, for like my birthday or whatever but i could only have one at a time but i didn't oh, care because i yeah. chose them like star wars figures i want a red <laughs> one and then you'd have a red one and then you'd wait for the next big birthday or christmas or maybe yeah, you've got some one. pocket money you go i like a blue one now and then like oh. really slowly you collect them but sometimes if i was at my dad's office the people who did the drawings the drawers, I believe they were called. Yeah. Um, they'd be sitting around drawing their adverts. If there was some left over that were old, mm. I would get my hands on them because they would be chucked. And how you revive them is um, you get, like you know, like a yellow can of lighter fuel. Right, yeah. If you just pour some of that on the tip of the pen, oh, it, right. it revives it for a certain what amount of time. Life. It's like you know. pulling a choke on a car. Yeah. <laughs> So, little tip for you there. I don't know if they still allow these sorts of pens because, um, uh, probably because people, I mean, some people overdid it with the sniffing and dropped dead, of course, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, there were many deaths. It was more merely spikes and pens, wasn't it? Solvent right deaths were yeah. huge. I don't know if they still are now. My brothers were so into solvents, right? It was unbelievable. Just <laughs> non-stop solvent, 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 solvent. Yeah. Sniff, and it sniff, was sniff, disgusting. Sniff. They'd do it in yeah. the house. They'd get fucking glue and pour it into bags. I mean, I won't name on which one. On the sleeve was, of their jumpers, that kind pro- of thing. Probably the brother you'd least expect was, of the three of them, was absolutely like a, a solvent fanatic. And I still sometimes ask him about it now, and he talks he talks about it like a connoisseur of solvent. Misty, I was going to use the word connoisseur. Yeah, then, that's yeah. what he's like. He's like, you know, like a sommelier would yeah. talk to you about wine. That's what my brother's like talking about solvents. I mean, I, I doubt he's done a solvent since yeah. he was like fifteen. But I think between the age of about twelve and fifteen, it was just like his life revolved around solvents. I mean, you could you could get gloy. That was an entry level kind yeah. of solvent, but the, yeah. the hit wasn't very I strong. Actually, it I, should tell, I should tell him to do a podcast about solvent nostalgia. <laughs> you could have a different guest each week talking about yeah. right. Each week I asked, um, "What was your first solvent? What was your last solvent? What was your best solvent? And which <laughs> solvent are you putting? Are you putting in the bin?" <laughs> right. So, right. You get which, one which solvent one? you can throw in the bin. Which is which, it? Which one do you want to send to Solvent Hell? (laughs) 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 It's mad those things where you just make up like fantasy, like just you just make some shit up and then I don't know and turn it into a form of entertainment like that food heaven, food hell. I suppose it's just testament to how thick people are, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, jalapeno. Um, so then fat pens, yeah. Um, fat pens are all arranged back there. But Bob Godfrey, yeah, did, did Henry's Cat. Um, we'll get to see what else he did. He did loads of stuff. Henry's um, Cat. Some was well known, e- some not so well known. Henry's Cat was like, um, there was a girl in my tutor group at school and she was very common, really common. Okay. I mean, like there was a lot of common kids, but she was like excessively common. All and right. uh, But she was nice. And actually, I, I won't name her because I still see her around sometimes. And... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if she's still she's as common. common. But Can't she was tell. nice. She was nice common. And uh, we used to call her Henry's cat. Because Henry's cat, they used to go, Ow, said Henry's cat. And that's, yeah. that's how she talks. She'd yeah. go, Ow, fucking hell. What have I got in my sandwich? Ow, fish paste. 
Ah, oh, fucking hate this place. And they will be like, fuck me. She sounds like Henry's cat, that girl. <laughs> <laughs> and of yeah. course, Henry's cat, the voice was done by Bob Godfrey himself. Oh, okay. His uh, involvement grew uh, as his career grew as well. Henry's cat, yeah, like you said, went until 1995, apparently. Uh, that doesn't seem to tie with what I'm looking at in the series guide. They did 83, 84, mm. 86, mm. 87, 92 to 93. They were just putting them out like kind of special episodes, I think, in the end. But... Um, yeah, Henry's cat was great, and it's Bob Godfrey. And I remember reading or seeing some interviews with him. And he was quite subversive. He was kind of, a, kind of a, um, a hippie type fella, right? I think he was. He was. He definitely wasn't some kind of jolly let's do kids TV kind of fella. Yeah. There was a bit of subversive stuff. It's going always in there. good when like the people who make jolly t- children's content turn out to just be miserableists. Yeah, sort of funny, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, he also did. Do you remember the trio chocolate biscuit? Ah, oh. you remember those adverts? Trio, yeah, you can, yeah, yeah. you can see the similarity actually. He can't done you? them as well. Trio. Yeah. So that's your Bob Godfrey who did the illustrations. On I'll tell you what, who, who I'd like. I mean, it's another, it's the second cancelled person that I'm mentioning today. But I would love it if Morrissey had done a kids' TV show. Yeah. Well, maybe. I know you don't particularly like Morrissey being mentioned because oh, I don't mind I, it being mentioned. You, you, you've got a problem with his racism, right? <laughs> but <laughs> you've got some kind of problem with Morrissey's <laughs> incessant racist outpourings, it's which is fine. I, 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 I respect that, right? <laughs> but uh, I'm just saying, imagine if he had his own kids' TV show, either an animation that he wrote and voiced or yeah. something... Imagine, you know, run around with Mike Reed. Imagine if they brought it back, but it was hosted by Morrissey. Morrissey's run around. That'll be good. <laughs> yeah. On your marks, get set, run <laughs> around, <laughs> run around. See the little <laughs> children run. <laughs> <laughs> Suffer, little children. Run like you're running from Hindley and Brady. <laughs> on the moors at night time <laughs> hell, see how you cry <laughs> <laughs> yeah just an idea Your for any of our eyes in the the Lancashire night sky <laughs> fucking hell you uh any uh well I believe we have some high flying television executives who tune in from time to time so another really? free another freebie for you there cunts <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, are you saying his latest trick, Morrissey? He walked off. Trick. He yeah. walked off stage because he's doing an outdoor show somewhere in America, I think. And he walked off stage because it was too cold. <laughs> <laughs> like five minutes at the gig or something. Yeah, he oh, it's too cold. It's icy on my delicate skin, my English Fuck skin, this. my English blood. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking knob. Um, hang on, I lost me, lost me place. There we are, rhubarb. That's what we're doing, isn't it? So Andy, yeah, it's great. Can I just ask you a quick question? Of course, just can. real quick. Have you ever referred to your stuff, the stuff that you've got in your house and whatever, yeah. as your belongings? <laughs> <laughs> because Fucking hell. if you haven't I'm really strongly suggesting you start doing that yeah I don't think I have it's just always been stuff stuff it sounds yeah. good though doesn't it I was in a shop earlier Belongings. and there was a box and it was just one of them boxes that people put bits in it's mainly mm. a posh person thing having a wooden box to put things in isn't it mm. um, but it said on it engraved for my belongings Oh, that's nice. And I thought, yeah, you can really elevate your stuff by referring to it as belongings, can't you? But it's it, it, it's a different level of stuff, isn't it? It's stuff that you want to put in a box. It's not all your stuff. It's just your belongings. You, mate, if you're at a hotel, right, even if it's a Premier Inn, go mm-hmm. up after you've had your breakfast, go up to the receptionist and go, what time's check out again? And mm-hmm. she goes, it's 
What time is it at Premier? Is it 11 or 12? It's 11, I think. Yeah. yeah. It's 11, sir. Mm. Oh, right. Okay. That just gives me half an hour to go upstairs and gather my belongings. Gather my belongings. Yeah. And she's like, fucking hell. I didn't realise we had an aristocrat staying with us. <laughs> Jesus, did you know? Yeah. That, that geezer in fucking room 318. He's like, I don't know, he's some sort of high roller from out of town. He looks so normal. He looks normal, he's just but like, ordinary. I don't know, I think he's like a, a ro- like I think he's in the royal family or something, but I he, mean, put, put it this way, he just said he had to go up and fucking gather his belongings. He, he looks and sounds really common. When I saw him come in, I thought he would probably talk like Henry's cat, but no. He's <laughs> really posh. He came in eating a cheese sandwich from the spa, right? <laughs> out of a plastic White box. Bread. White bread and everything. He didn't care. It looked disgusting. He was just eating it. And he spoke... When he checked in, he spoke to me and there was like all crumbs of cheese and bread flying out of his mouth. (laughs) And I thought, oh, quite common. But, you know, it's normal to see common people here. But now he's going on about his belongings that he reckons (laughs) he's got up in his room. Sometimes they come here if the travel lodge is sold out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And they have to fucking... They want to large it a bit in a Premier Inn. (laughs) He's like... Fucking hell! Now he's 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 got he's claiming he's got some belongings, and he didn't say he was going to pack them, right? He said he was going to gather them. He's gathering them. <laughs> Fucking hell. hell! Send someone up. Call the manager and send them up to help him. Yeah, we can't let a man like that gather his own belongings. Uh, How will it look on us? <laughs> activate the valet service. <laughs> he's a premium customer. <laughs> No, I've never, I've never used belongings before. Well, um, it's, to me, I would say file that next to um, walking around with your hands behind your back. Just gonna sit. I was just gonna bring that up. Yeah. Because uh, me and me boy were walking back from the Sunderland match the other week. Sunderland yeah. nil Cardiff one, and uh, there was a fella about six feet in front, and he walked all the way through the Sheep Falls towards town with the hands clasped behind the back. Was he a Sunderland fan or a Cardiff fan? He was a Sunderland fan. Sunderland nice. fan. You'd have to be to, you'd have to be a home fan to be um to be that, that confident. confident when you yeah. you have to feel like you're on your own turf. Well, even after a defeat as well. Yeah, I was astounded. Didn't bother him. But I thought I thought maybe he clocked me and he was taking the piss. Uh, Do you know what I mean? He'd seen me uh, and he'd gone in front and started doing the walk. It's certainly one of those. What I call it is life upgrades, right? Yeah. And yeah. we're we're quite good at identifying and dispensing life upgrades to our listeners. And mm. that's two examples that go really well together. Walk around with your hands clasped behind your back and refer to your stuff as your belongings. As your belongings. And you're aware. No looking back once you start doing that all the time. You will get... Tr- Honestly, you'll notice the difference. And yeah. abundance will come come upon you. Abundance, is that another one? Do we use that? Yeah, no, you know, like, there's a lot of people nowadays going around saying that you can manifest whatever you want. Noel Edmonds says that, doesn't he? Yeah, Cosmic ordering. He, he was saying it ages ago, but now it's going mainstream. Is it? It's on Instagram now, TikTok. There's, there's, a, there's a, a phrase that I heard earlier, quantum consciousness. Fucking anyway, great. apparently there's a, there's a science... There's <laughs> Tell a, me more. There's a scientific theory called the... Let me just quickly Google it. I think it's called the double slit. I know that sounds like a sex term. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> right. Double oh. slit test. Oh, I hope I don't okay, get any porn what? out of this. Double slit experiment. In modern physics, the double slit experiment is a demonstration yeah. that light and matter can display characteristics of close of both classically uh, defined waves and particles. Moreover, it displays mm. the fundamentally probabilistic nature of quantum mechanical phenomena. Follow right. me so far, right? Uh, this type of experiment was first performed by Thomas Young. Blah, blah, blah. This is what mm. happens, right? The fucking light will travel in waves. From, right. But if, you, if when a human looks upon it, it suddenly straightens out and starts travelling in a straight line yeah yeah right so that means the energy the light energy is being Mm. controlled by your own consciousness you expect to see the light in a straight line when you're not looking at it it's doing its own thing it prefers Mm. to travel in waves but when you look at it it goes in a straight line so 
what right. everything we see around us is being shaped by our own consciousness. Our own interpretation of it. We form okay. it. Yeah. We form it. Now, once you get your nut around that, it's a short step to thinking. Because when someone was telling me this earlier, I was really interested and I was trying to follow it because it was complicated stuff. But I'll be honest, all I was thinking was, this sounds like something that if I master it, I could conjure a pair of tits at will. Yeah, yeah. Just I on could their see, own. Just I could, see, I could t- see some tits whenever I wanted. Detached from a body, just floating no. tits? No, well, it depends how my consciousness would want, to, want them to manifest. I probably yeah. wouldn't want them detached yeah. from a body. It did it's, make me think a couple of things from my youth that I think tied in to um, quantum consciousness. Number one, there was a girl I fancied really badly uh, when I was about 13, 14. Actually, the crust probably went on for, well, probably still to today, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> if I saw her, I'd probably still be like, what? But um, <gasps> I was walking along the street at the weekend when I was about 14 and I couldn't stop thinking about her. And I started to think, oh, I wish I could bump into her now. But I was nowhere near where she lived and nowhere near the school. Mm. But I kept thinking, wouldn't it be amazing if I just bumped into it? And I kept thinking it over and over again. Then suddenly a shop door opens. Who steps out? Fucking her. There she is. You manifested her. I yeah. manifested this girl that I fancied. And then, of course, that should have been a moment. If it was a rom-com, it'd be like, I manifested her. This is where it all starts. But in fact, it just went, all right, and carried on yeah. walking. <laughs> it went all red. <laughs> <laughs> but the other one is, which is a very early story in um, in uh, Top Flight Time Machine, when we used to do, was it called Surprise Boobs, Surprise Tits? We had to stop Something it because like there yeah. was too many wrong um, yeah. But it was about when I used to sit at Stamford Brook Station, which was my local tube station, to get That's the right. tube to school in the morning. Mm. And there was just a woman who every morning would get undressed in, uh, and get out of the, in, in and then out of the shower on the flats opposite, right in my eye line from the platform. Yeah. And I often felt that I'd manifested that as well. Yeah. So I'm start. what I'm saying is, mate, I'm starting to believe in manifesting shit. Okay. So you could do that. I mean, you could just imagine some tits, couldn't you? Yeah, you can do that. They don't have to be there in front of you. I mean, you could probably 3D print some as well if you're really desperate. Is it the same as just, uh, you know, just seeing like, oh... I don't know. Just do surprise tits, mate. Like you're out it the all, window. Look out the window it, and then there's a woman. She's just yeah. like topless. It all feels a little bit like the kind of stuff Brian Cox will come out with and everyone just goes, oh, yeah, that's brilliant. Cause Brian yeah, Cox and he doesn't explain it, it. And he can't back it up. Yeah, it feels well, a bit like that. I can back it up because I have a Wikipedia page open in front of me, which right. is entitled The Double Slit Experiment. Fucking hell. Right, Look it I up, mean, mate. It's all there. Yeah, I mean, is it? Is it? Does it class as history box? Oh, are we gonna? Are we gonna spin off into science box? Oh, and, I like where you're going. Yeah, could happen. Could we happen. Could we, haven't, we haven't completed all the history boxes. yet, but we're getting there. We're gonna have to we've, think of something to do after we've done history. Human history, at least not. We and quite a lot of natural history. When you think of the one we did about mud, that we went on mud. for weeks. Yeah. So substance. we've done natural history. Yeah. I'll tell you what we should do as a history box. Just simply What's this. That? This is the title. The Dinosaurs. Yeah. Fuck me, that'll be like four years. Yeah. Four years of episodes. Just everything about the dinosaurs, because dinosaurs were really living out loud, weren't they? Did they we had not do one, the, di- did we they had do one, the dinosaur book? They the had Osborne one he- book of dinosaurs. No, we did monsters. Oh, we did monsters and ghosts. Monsters and ghosts. I see where you're thinking it, though, because monsters, a dinosaur is like a, a cross between a monster and a ghost. <laughs> and a ghost, yeah. <laughs> if you think about it, they're monsters yeah. from the past that still define our present. So if they're around now, they're ghosts. I tell you definition. what, if it wasn't for those cunts, we wouldn't have all this global warming going on. Because don't true. forget... It's their fucking fossils that we're, that we're fucking melting yeah. into oil that is then destroying the planet. Well, we should have just left them alone, shouldn't we? There's fossils. For leave the fossils to look at. Hey, leave well alone. Mm. That if, if if once mankind civilization dies out, which feels like it's going to be pretty soon, uh, I reckon you know maybe in another thousand years or something, it will start to slowly rise again. 
Yeah. And if there's anything in the history books left after we've all burnt to a cinder yeah. under the sun's horrific rays, right? Um, I hope that future civilizations take one thing away from what we've learned, and that is leave fossils where they fucking are. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. And fossil byproducts. Yeah. Um, right, that's the first episode of the Rhubarb Odyssey. Uh, I think we've demonstrated, but yet again, why we're not allowed on talk sport anymore. Um, right, can we'll I just say this? This part two. This oh, episode was then. sponsored by Lavazza Coffee because I had a fucking triple before we started recording. <laughs> that that makes sense. Um, <laughs> all right, we'll be back with a bit more rhubarb. Maybe we'll even look at an episode <laughs> next time. But you know, thanks for listening and goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.